Bruchem Aboim. Thank you very much for uh, attending and welcome to our home. The, um, the topic this week of my thoughts is about the concept of truma. Uh, again, the special gift that's given to the Kohen, to the priest. So, truma is the first, again, truma is the word tarum, meaning to elevate. So, truma is the first of the tithing that a farmer separates when he harvests his field. The Torah does not specify just how much produce the farmer must separate. The, only, uh, the Torah only tells us that the farmer must do so. It is the rabbis, rabbinically, who have placed an amount upon the Torah requirement. They said that if a person is stingy, uh, they should give a minimum of 1.5%. That's the least amount you would give. A regular person would give 2%. And a person with a generous heart would give two and a half percent. Now, after the farmer separates the truma, God then requires him to separate ten percent to be given to the Levite. This is referred to as Maser Rishon, the first tithing. The Levite is then required to separate ten percent of his gift and give it to a Kohen of his choice. This is referred to as Truma Smicer the truma that was separated from the tithing. The farmer is then required to separate one more thing, one more tithing before he can partake of his harvest. He separates another 10%, which, is required, which he is required to take to Jerusalem on the first, second, fourth, and fifth year of what we call the Shemitah cycle. We'll explain that in a minute. It is referred to as Meiser Shani, the second tithing. This produce can only be consumed within the walls of the city. If a farmer lives too far to transport all of his produce easily to Jerusalem, then the Torah gives him the option of redeeming his produce with money. He then takes the money and uses it to buy food. That money takes on the same sanctity as the produce that he was required to bring to Jerusalem. That being the case, any food purchased with his miser money, can only be eaten within the walls of Jerusalem. Now, in order for the farmer to convert his produce into money, he must add an additional one-fifth to the worth of the produce. In the third and sixth years, of the, uh, the farmer separates 10% of his harvest, which is referred to as maaser ani, the poor man's tithing. This tithing is distributed directly to the poor. It is considered so special that the Torah in the Book of Devarim and the portion of Kisavo refers to the Miser Ani as Shinas HaMiser, the year of tithing. You know, we even see an allusion to this concept in connection with the creation of the world. It was only on the third day that God Almighty repeated the Hebrew word Tov, good, twice. Then on the sixth day of creation, the day that God created Adam, first man, God said that it was Tov Ma'od. Very good. This is seen as an indication that God considers the gifts of the poor the most admirable of traits. Then on the seventh year, which is referred to as the Shemitah, the sabbatical year, uh, there is no tithing. God, as the owner of the land, had decided that everything in this world needs to rest, even the land. And so, just like we are commanded to rest on the seventh day, the Shabbat, so too are we commanded to allow the land to rest on the seventh year, the Shemitah. The land is considered ownerless. Anyone, Jew or Gentile alike, can enter any field at any time and take whatever has grown naturally, such as fruit that grows on trees. For the whole year, the land cannot be worked. The farmer must allow it to remain fallow. What we learn from these tithings is that the verse in Psalm 24 states, Hashem ha'oretzim alone. To God belongs the earth and all of its bounty. The farmer is only a sharecropper. The, the true owner of the field is God Almighty himself. Our tithing is, so to speak, a payment to the owner of the field, and the rest is ours as our wages for working his field. So when we tithe, we are doing so as a representative of the owner, God Almighty himself. He shares his bounty with all the close members and servants of his household. The poor, Miser Ani, the priest, Truma, the Levite, 
Mysore Risha. In addition, God Almighty even invites us to join him in his capital city, Jerusalem, Mysore Shani, to share in his gifts. We are, by our culture, an agricultural nation. Many of the laws of the Torah deal with farmers and farming. This goes back to Adam, first man, who, after eating from the Eitz Hadas, from the Tree of Knowledge, was told by God in the first portion of the book in Genesis, Zeus Apecha Tocholetha, by the sweat of your brow, you will eat bread. So the question has to be, was this a punishment or was it just a way for a benevolent father to make us better and more productive individuals? Was it God's plan to make us so busy so that we don't have the time to sin? The Talmud tells us that the two things that are difficult for a person is being rich and being poor. The common denominator, time. Time is a double-edged sword. It can make you or break you. The Talmud tells us that a person would prefer one bushel of his own wheat than nine bushels of someone else's. We see the same scenario even today. There is never a time when you walk into a supermarket that they are out of tomatoes. Yet people plant tomatoes and it costs them a fortune. Then they have so many more tomatoes than they can eat. This allows them to give them to their friends as a gift. The gift is always accompanied with the words, these are the sweetest and best tomatoes that you have ever tasted. <laughs> to you, they taste like a tomato, but not to the person who grew them. To them, they taste like gold. God has allowed us the joy and privilege to reap the benefits of our labor, the sweat of our brows. After all, before a farmer places a seed into the ground, they must first perform many strenuous tasks such as plowing, pruning, pulling out stumps and weeds. After all of his hard work, he then prays to God Almighty that something will grow. By praying, he makes God a partner in his endeavor. He must have faith since immediately after he places the seeds in the ground, nothing happens. He has to wait. He must be patient. Something that Adam, first man, failed to do. From Nahum of Bressel of states that as a consequence of Adam, first man eating from the tree of knowledge, the produce of the land was cursed. The rectification of this curse is accomplished through the truma that is taken from the grain and given to the Kohen. Since the Kohanim, the priests are commanded to observe extra levels of purity, they are considered pure. By achieving this level of purity, they are then able to purify the grain and all that grows from the earth. You know, we see a similar scenario with the Jews who stood at the foot of Mount Sinai. After they received the Torah from God Almighty, Moshe went up the mountain to receive the first set of tablets on which God had inscribed the Ten Commandments. Moshe told the people that he would return in 40 days. They waited for him to return from the mountain of Sinai with the two tablets. Well, he was late. And in their impatience, they made the golden calf. There are many lessons that God teaches us in life. One of the most important lessons is patience. When a farmer plants his field, he sees nothing. Yet underneath the earth, things are happening. The seed he planted has rotted, and now a new plant is beginning to emerge. A form of tchiasa mesim, if you will, of revival of the dead. He does not have permission to give up, even though he may not see any immediate results. He has learned to never give up. He waters and weaves and cares for the naked soil until finally sprouts appear. And that sight lifts his heart, but he is a long way from harvesting a successful crop. Experience has taught him that he must stay diligent and protect his crops as best he can. But in the end, he knows that without the help of the owner of the field, God Almighty himself, success is impossible. So every day he prays and he works his field in the hope that his prayers and efforts will reap success. He has a front row seat watching God perform his miracles. You know, the truma, the first of the tithing the farmer separates from his harvest, 
is unlike any of the other tithings that he is commanded to separate. Truma can only be eaten by a coin who is spiritually pure. If anyone other than a coin eats from the Truma, they are culpable and receive the spiritual punishment of Karas, which is seen as the excision of their soul. Yet we read in the portion of Emmar that not only the members of his household, his wife and children, are permitted to eat Truma. In addition, his non-Jewish slave and even his animals are permitted to eat from it. Think of it. Imagine if Aaron, the high priest, is sitting down to dinner and he hears a knock at his door. Well, he goes to the door and there is his brother. I didn't get that. Could you try again? Ah, kid. Sorry about that. <laughs> Cute. Anyways, imagine if Aaron the priest is sitting down to dinner and there hears a knock at his door. He goes to the door and there is his brother Moshe. He invites him in. Moshe sees that Aaron is eating dinner and he asks him if he could join the family in their meal. Apologetically, Aaron says no. Since they are eating truma, which Moshe, as a Levite, is not permitted to eat. Then there's another knock at the door, and again Aaron answers the door, and standing there is Shmuel Hanavi, Samuel the prophet. Aaron invites him in. Shmuel sees that the family is eating dinner, and he says that he's hungry, and he wonders if he can join them in their meal. Again, Aaron says no. This is the case even though it states in Psalm 99 6 that Shmuel was as great as Moshe and Aaron together. Still, Shmuel is not a Kohen and therefore cannot eat Truma. So Aaron sits down to finish his meal, but then there's another knock at his door. He answers the door and standing in front of him is King David. Well, Aaron bows respectfully and invites him in. David, seeing that the Aaron is eating dinner with his family, asks if he can join them. To David's amazement, Aaron says no. David is taken back. He says, are you turning down a request from your king? Aaron says, with all due respect, your highness, the king of kings, God Almighty himself, has commanded me not to share my truma with anyone who is not a Kohen, even a king. The three guests say, well, they understand. But then Aaron's little grandson comes in, accompanied by a non-Jewish slave whom Aaron owns. The young boy asks his grandfather if he could join the family in their meal. And with a big smile on his face, Aaron says, well, of course. The three guests are able to understand that Aaron would want his young grandson to join him in his meal. He may be young, but he is still a Kohen. But when the non-Jewish slave asks if he too can partake of some of the food that is being served, well, then Aaron tells him to help himself to whatever he wants. Aaron then adds that after the slave is through eating that he should take some of the truma and he should feed it to the animals. Well, Moshe, Shmuel, and King David all look at Aaron a, a, a bit surprised. They say to him, well, you know, they can understand that he would serve his young grandchild the truma, but how is it that he would allow not only his non-Jewish slave, but also his animals to eat the truma, but not them? He tells them, that this is what God has commanded in his Torah, and that he has no choice but to follow God's command. So how are we, how are we to understand this? The Talmud in the Tractate of Brachos states that anyone who enjoys anything in this world without making a blessing of Bracha is considered as if he has used something that is sanctified, an act that is referred to as me'ilah, as it says in Psalm 24, 1, as I mentioned, Lashem Orasim to God belongs the earth and all of its bounty. The question is, how can making a blessing remove the sanctity of anything in this world? It states in the portion of Emor that a non-Jewish slave that is the property of a Kohen is permitted to eat truma, just as the Kohen himself. So the slave adopts the status of a Kohen since he is the coin's acquisition. So too, when we make a blessing, we acknowledge that we are the servants of God Almighty. As our sages tell us, Evid Melech Melech, the servant of a king is a king. 
Only then are we permitted to enjoy even holy things in this world, much like the non-Jewish slave of a Kohen who is permitted to eat truma. In addition, we can extrapolate that even if we are only on the level of an animal, as long as we acknowledge that we are God's animal, then we too have the permission to eat from God's table. So, though Moshe, Shmuel, and King David would not be able to eat from Aaron's table, we simple Jews, who are on the level of animals, have the right and the ability to eat from God's table. These laws of tithing teach us that we owe God Almighty a great debt of gratitude for all the goodness that He bestows upon us. And by our acknowledgement, will we merit to usher in the coming of Mashiach Sakana quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. I hope you found this interesting and entertaining and informative. Again, God should bless you with health and happiness and success. And uh, again, thank you for attending. Shabbat Shalom.